Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Robin with another edition of Horror Pop After Midnight. And my guest tonight is Michael Treblecock, who is the frontman for the 90s band The Killjoys. He's also a music score composer for horror films, also a filmmaker. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? Yeah, thank you for um, coming on out of your busy schedule. Um, so how much fun did you have when you were a part of The Killjoys? Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was uh, in the 90s. It was, uh, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't really a long time. We were, you know, we, we released our first album in 94, and I think we were done by like 98. But it's had a, it's had a sort of a lasting uh, effect, I think, on, on some people. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, in the 90s were weird. It was a different time for sure. Hey, that's when mu- that's when music was good, man. The eighties and the nineties. Come on. <laughs> yeah, well, it was. Uh, it had, you know, every decade. I've, I've said this before, but every decade seems to have its own style up until about two thousand, and then everything. I guess everything splintered off into its own, if into its own orbit, sort of thing. So there was no real unifying style i think rap has been the unifying you know the the sort of run through you know you know the 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 theme that runs through all of these decades uh is kind of rap so uh you know and up you know the you know in the 90s it was of course it was the grunge thing in the 80s the the electrical you know electronic pop sort of thing and so everything sort of had its own style up until up until you know about 2000 but yeah. I, anyway, the '90s were good. I thought it was, it was it was fun, and I'm still I can still put that hat on. We're actually recording again this weekend, and uh, we're going to put out an EP, I think, and maybe even an album eventually. So, so we're just doing it because you know our drummer. Uh, this is one reason, anyway. I mean, we we have fun doing it anyway. But the drummer, he nearly died of COVID. Not you know, a couple years ago. Like he was on the ventilator and all that stuff. So these near death experiences, they sort of they kick you in the butt a little bit. And we were sort of thinking, well, that would suck if he had died and we hadn't done anything else, you know. So we just thought that we'd you know, you'd sort of put the put the band back together and uh, and uh, yeah, be on a mission from God, and that's what we're going to do. Hey, amen to that. And then you were in another band uh, called Cemetery Spawn, which focused on old horror movie theme songs which i think is kind of cool and i like the name yeah it's a it's sort of a stephen king reference uh you know the cemetery it's spelled that way uh the stephen king way of cemetery and uh i think that started from i did a movie called exorcism of the dead i did the score for it and the director wanted me to do an end credits theme song but he wanted it to sort of sound like Dawkins. Uh, the the uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, Dream song, Warriors. I think it was three, three or four. It was three. it was part three. Dream, Dream Warriors. Warriors, yeah. Dream Warriors. So um, I did something. Uh, well, just the song called "Exorcism of the Dead," and that was so much fun. I just kept writing more and more stuff along those lines. Like, um, oh man, I don't remember the second one I've done. I did three volumes of of of. Uh, songs for 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 horror movies and uh you know like animator uh um i did something for uh ouija mummy for uh uh you know every movie sort of that i've done i did mystic shield for ouija shark 2 so these are all sort of all in the cemetery spawn uh uh wheelhouse we and i uh, actually put a band together like a real band because it's usually just me in the studio uh, writing and, and performing everything so but we did have a live thing going on there for a while and that might come back again so so yeah that's cem- that's the cemetery spawn story hey that's pretty cool so what transitioned you from being a musician um doing scores for horror movies and then you decided to get into uh filmmaking well i, I think i've heard this story before when you start off uh scoring films you don't have any films to score so partly I got into film scoring <clears throat> to score my own, my own, you know, I, I got into filmmaking to score my own movies, you know, to get some, to, to you know, to get some practice, uh, you know, how it all works. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's also a really great, 
you know, you get to know how to put, how to edit. Like I, I edit all my own stuff. Like I do the same thing. Like I do with cemetery spawn. I just do everything on my own. So it's all, of course, with a, with a crew and a, you know, there's yeah. DOP and all that, but I do all the editing. I put the music to it, uh, all the sound effects and, and, you know, you know, edit all the sound and all that stuff. So getting to know the timing of editing and, and how they're put together, I think that's really a, a good skill to, for a composer to, to know how to do. I think so, so too. I, I ran camps for kids for a while there that uh, the, the, I would help them do their own movie. So I've got a bunch of those under my belt, too. And I did rock bands for kids. So we also did a bunch of music videos for them. And so I've, I've edited quite a lot of stuff over the years. My favorite short of yours is uh, Spider Mama. Yeah, I love it. I thought it was so original and unique, you know, about this, you know, uh, elderly lady at a nursing home. You know, she goes and cooks something in the microwave and gets bit by a spider from a microwave and then starts having all these powers. That was clever. Um, How'd you come up with uh, that uh, funny type of film? Well, you know, it comes from sort of a sad uh, situation, actually. My, my, um, my, girlfriend's mother was in the uh was in a nursing home and and while she's in there you know i mean it wasn't like she was treated badly or anything but but being there you know uh you know especially at christmas time with the you know the snow and everything it's a very it's it's just a sad situation and she wasn't getting out you know we knew that she wasn't going to be leaving and uh so i sort of in my mind i sort of um was thinking about ways that she could escape so so that was that was one of the escape plans that I had I had uh, thought out for, her. and uh, so she did eventually die. That's why at the end of the of the movie it says uh, uh, for Margot Montecalvo who escaped because that's uh, ultimately that's how she escaped. But would have been more fun the other way for sure. And then in the, another interesting one uh, you had too was chewed. <laughs> yeah. That was that was uh, I enjoyed that one, man. That, that, uh, I was just I was just so hooked into it, man. That was just <laughs> that was just a crazy uh, film. <laughs> yeah, that was a different one. I had originally planned that as a film for kids, actually, <laughs> as like a camp film, and then it just kind of got blown out of proportion. And I thought, well, you know, for one thing, I can't have kids getting, you know body parts chewed off or anything like that so that that would be inappropriate for children so so i ended up just doing it on my own and doing my own my own sort of actual film with it so and it's in the fright vision uh compilation right now yeah i love those type of anthology films it it fits perfect with that yeah me too. <laughs> i think creep show sent me down that path years ago loving those kind of movies so you're also a big romero fan uh <laughs> Um, yeah. What got you infatuated with Romero? Uh, oh man, it's hard to say what the first thing was. Um, I've liked, I've been a fan for so long. Uh, it might have, it might have really been Dawn of the Dead that kind of blew my mind. Uh, that made me a huge fan. I actually. You know, and I, you know, over the years, I mentioned Creepshow earlier. I sort of considered him as a family member in a weird way. He never knew he was a family member, but I considered him like he was like an uncle or something like that. Like I just was so, uh, I, I just thought he was a really uh, nice person that I w- would have liked to meet one day. And I did like, I, and I did meet him one day. I uh, got to work on a, on a, a theater production of night of the living dead so a, a live version of it in toronto that uh george and uh russ striner and and jo- john russo were the uh, uh producers of it so they were all there that whole time so i got to work work with george a little bit uh just before he, just before he died so that was really a lucky uh lucky thing and then I also have a movie, or a, I have a song in the movie called uh, "Iron City Ass Kickers," that they were sort of they they dug up this uh, pilot that George had done uh, in the in the eighties sometime, and uh, and so they wanted to replace a song that they didn't have the rights to on it. So I sort of 
I sort of asked them if they would like a like to use a song that I already had Blade of Fury ready to go. So so that so Blade of Fury, that cemetery spawn song, is actually in Iron City Ass Kickers. Uh, a, a George, I lost George Romero pilot, uh, all about wrestling in in Pittsburgh. Wow, that's interesting. I never knew about that. And I'm, and, um, I'm a big pro wrestling fan, too. I mean, I like my horror and pro wrestling. I never, I learned something tonight. Wow, I didn't even know that. <laughs> nice. So it's available. I think there is a version on YouTube, but there's, they really, they cleaned it up. They did a great job of it. They might have even done a little bit of editing on the new, the, the sort of cleaned up version of it, the, the one they released. I've got it on VHS, actually, which is, which is kind of cool. And, uh, but there's also DVD versions. Uh, so yeah, it's out there and it's, it's a fun, uh, an interesting, uh, relic as well. I bet it's a sought out too. Uh, so you must have an impressive VHS collection. I mean, there's a, there's more and more collectors getting back and collecting the VHS tapes. <laughs> getting back into it. That's the, that's the thing I, I sort of lost or, or sold or got rid of a lot over the years which i really regret now because i'd like i'd have a lot bigger collection but you know you know you move so much at a certain point you're like why am i dragging these things around you know i still dragging my records around too so you know at a certain point you're like well i've got to just make some space here and and then yep sure regret that <laughs> some really good stuff you probably had but that's so- all right that's all right i'm sort of rebuilding the collection Oh, that's good. Um, you probably have some great treasure gems too. <laughs> I still do, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was listening to one. Uh oh, what? Uh oh, what's he got? <laughs> yeah, I've got a big box from Wizard. Was it Wizard? It's right there. It's two thousand maniacs. That's one of my prized uh, possessions there, in the VHS world. And uh, what else is over there? Oh, I've got Necromantic one and two. Ooh. which actually the first one, <clears throat> the second one got here. No problem. I ordered it through film threat magazine in the eighties. And, uh, um, the, the first one, the, the cover kit, cause they sent the cover separately from the tape. I guess they thought it would get through customs more easily, but the tape didn't make it, but it came, uh, but I got a letter saying that the tape was surrendered to the crown was the way it's because because of the questionable content of course in necromantic movies so you know it was kind of a bit of a badge of honor that the that movie was surrendered to the crown kind of ridiculous but but i guess they weren't sure if it was real or what the heck was going on but but so i do have so i ended up putting a copy of of necromantic one into the into the the, uh, the case that i got but I do have a real legitimate necromantic too. So, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> that's usually hard to find. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of hard to find stuff for sure. And it, you know, at the time, it was a little bit more easy to find. I used to go to horror conventions. I used to go to to New York. I went to Chicago, and you know, wherever wherever things were happening, I would I would go and pick up VHS tapes or you know, whatever you do at horror conventions. Oh, there's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do at horror co- <laughs> conventions. Sure Those sure are the best is. people to hang out with too. <laughs> yeah. I still go to them uh, once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever been to Whorehound? Um, have I, been to that one? I don't think I have been to that one. I was at like the Fangoria weekend of horrors. Nice. And I forget what the one in Chicago was. Is it flashback weekend? This again, this was a long time ago, so maybe not. And I don't think it was horror hand. I don't think there's any such thing as horror hand at the time. So, oh yeah. But anyway, if yeah, you... no, I have. I don't think I've been to horror hand. No. Oh, you should I've do shock stock. Shock stock up here is a good one. I definitely need to check that out because uh, I. London. Yeah, shock stock. I'll have to definitely check that out. Um, I was listening besides you, you know, doing scores for like horror films. Um, I listened to one of your uh, um, songs you did, which I liked. It was "On the Beach." Oh yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, that was so inspiring. It was so relaxing, and um, I just loved. I just loved how you played the bass on it. I just loved loved the addition to the bass. Uh, it. Yeah. 
it, it was phenomenal. I, um, I listened to at least probably 10 times already. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I forget even why I did that. Like, uh, what the inspiration behind it was. I don't, I, I don't remember what, what went on there. Uh, <laughs> it was, a, it could have been an unused cue from a movie that I used as a demo and just kept working on it and working on it and put it out eventually on my own. Cause I think it's really just a, I didn't release it as a song. I released it only as a video. So it's sort of a, one of those oddities. So it's not on any record or on Spotify or anything. Dude, that I, I just liked it. Just remind me of um, growing, um, growing up back home in California because I'm from California and, yeah. just, and hearing that and like by the beach, I was just picturing myself at the beach with that song going through my head. Thank you for yeah, making I, that. that <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was pretty cool. Is there any uh, new music you're working on right now for any like horror films? I'm working on something for Steve Rodzinski um, called Shingles the Movie. Uh, it's another anthology film for stories and uh, based on s- something called, it's a book series called Shingles by a group of authors called Authors and Dragons. Okay. And it's a great, great movie. Uh, uh, so that's what I'm working on right now. Um, I, I've got some stuff coming in that's not quite done yet. There's one called Kilgore and the Grizzly Abyss that they're They've almost got a rough cut completed, so that's going to be soon. That's a all puppet cast uh, sword and sorcery movie, so I can't wait for that one. Uh, I, and the other one is something called Kaiju that I'm working on, and that's going to be that has a pretty good budget, a pretty decent budget that we're gonna we're we're putting together. Uh, a, we're contracting an orchestra out for this one. So that's going to be one that's down the road a bit, but might be out by the end of the year, I would, I would think. So there's a lot on the very close horizon. Shingles I'm doing right now. You got me at uh, Fantasy and Puppets, so that's cool. Oh, man, man, that one, yeah, I can't wait. I just can't wait. I've never seen and, nothing like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> and it's supposed to be quite the splatter fest, too, so uh, that's right up my alley. Ooh, Splatterfest. Ooh. Puppet, a puppet Splatterfest. Ooh, I've never seen that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. No, I've I, seen, just, I just can't wait. I've seen a film called Clay Zombies where humans turn into claymation zombies. <laughs> yeah, I've actually, I've seen a few claymation, like, uh, gory stuff. A few claymation gory movies, but n- not puppets. Oh, my so, gosh. Yeah, that's it's interesting. Be interesting. <laughs> that's awesome um so um what got you into uh falling in love with a uh, horror uh what was what's that one movie that really like drove you in and you're like man this is i'm i'm, I'm a horror fan for life I, it's been since i was a little little kid and i used to watch something called sci-fi theater on saturday mornings and afternoons it was like late late morning after cartoons sci-fi theater was on and it had like you know got all those old godzilla and uh, all those that that monster crowd uh so i really think that's sort of what started it my parents i remember seeing the beast with five fingers is that what it's called peter Lorre? yeah we rented it at the cottage when i was probably about four years old and we rented it at the library you could rent films like actual films and a projector so you're watching this movie with Peter Lorre and the hand coming after him. And, and, uh, that was definitely a seminal moment in my horror life for sure. Uh, so I think, I think my parents might've warped me a bit with stuff like that. And we used to watch, um, Kolchak, the night stalker when I was a kid too. So all, all of that stuff really contributed to my just love of horror. That's cool. I mean, because you had, you um you have the best of both worlds. I mean, you're a musician, and also you get to do horror at the same time, man. How fun is yeah. that? It's great. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of a better way to spend my time. That, that I mean, that's just like playing wild. Um, the movies that got me into you know like horror like you was uh Joe Bob Briggs. He's the one that um, made my yeah. mind all warped up. I have to blame Joe Bob. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, he warped a lot of people, I think, and he's still at, still at it these days. So, so oh, he's great. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. It's <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, um, I got another question for you. Uh, what do you? Uh, what's what's your thoughts on uh, streaming versus uh, physical media? Well, uh, being a, a bit of a control freak, I like to have, uh, you know, because I don't really trust physical media and it's happened, I mean, not physical media, uh, streaming, because sometimes I've been gone to watch something that I was sure was there and then some, suddenly it's gone. So I think just for the stability and, you know, always having Ghoulies 2 around, uh, I, I need to have the physical copy of it to, to make sure that, it, you know, when I'm in that mood, I can... I can watch that movie because, uh, you know, they're taking stuff down and putting it back up all the time. So, you know, you just want to be able to go with your moods. Right. So, so I do enjoy physical media for that. And there's just something, you know, something about seeing a cover and the tactile nature of it. And, uh, I, that I really like even the act of putting a, a tape into the VHS machine is a fun, it's a fun time to me. So, so I'm definitely a physical media fan. I I definitely am too, and um, in your opinion, how long do you think physical media is going to be around? I I believe it'll always be around as long as we're wanting to watch movies. I don't think it's going to disappear, and people are still making VHS. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, they're still making DVDs, Blu-rays. I don't I don't think it's going to go totally streaming. I couldn't I couldn't see it. I think. The artwork is worth it. The extras are worth it. The, uh, that, like I said, the tactile nature of it is worth it. There's just so many pluses to having physical media. I, I totally agree with you. And another question for you too is, what does horror mean to you? Hmm, what does it mean to me? You know, I don't think. Uh, I I've always liked. I, I love scary horror as well, but to me, the the colorful, crazy, the thing about horror is you can do anything. Like, there's so many things under the horror umbrella. There's, you know, there's sci-fi, there's zombies, there's all the you know, vampires, there's, there's so many different monsters and creative ideas out there. Um, so, uh, to me, to me, that's, that's what horror is. It's fun it's eccentric it's it's an imagination gone wild so that's what i love about horror um if you got a chance to make a film uh any type of you know horror film you wanted um what type of uh, uh music ideas would you have to mix it into your own unique film hmm um i i, I don't I would love to do something that has, I mean, I, I love this orchestra idea, but I, I would love to have just a unlimited funds to pay musicians to, I mean, you know, some people have this already, but I, I don't, I do a lot of movies on my own because the budget's not quite there. And I'd like to incorporate uh, some strange musical ideas as well. Like I think they used to do this, more often like bloody pit of horror where you could hire a you know a timp <laughs> timpani player and uh i don't know what else they had in that one but you know a timpani and a recorder and, and have them play your score and and I, I that's really sort of what i'm i'm heading towards i believe anyway just just sort of something unique to every every film that that really uh is as much of a voice as the as the visuals are um, so I think that's sort of something I'd like to do. That'd be fun because I'm a fan of music scores because in certain films, the music score can be uh, the main part of the film, like the character in certain scenes, in my opinion. Yeah, well, well they do that. Yeah, they do that on purpose. You've got like a late motifs sort of thing. A lot of it comes from like opera terms that that we're still using now, like from Wagner sort of thing. So, So when, you know, Darth Vader comes in, you, you know Darth Vader's around before he, you even see him because you hear his theme, right? And they do that in horror movies a lot, too. It's sort of a more of a, a classic old idea, but there, it's, it's, still, it's still there, definitely. 
I think so too. And one of my uh, favorite uh, soundtracks out there that has a good score, which really nailed it, was from the new Batman film. I mean, that score was like eerie, creepy, energetic, and it just made the whole film like that you were really there at Gotham with Batman as a detective trying to solve this crime. It just the music. It just made the atmosphere to for a fun film to watch. I, I hate to say I haven't seen that one yet, but I, I, I really want to. <laughs> but I haven't seen it yet. And I've heard great things about the score, of course, as well. You know, the score I really like, a recent one is Crimes of the Future. I just, that score, it's like, it's like in my bones. I, you know, every Cronenberg movie I love. And, uh, and his, and Howard Shore's music is always such a, it seems, and it's different for every film too. Like The Fly was sort of an operatic big orchestral uh, score and this one is sort of a little it's a sort of a smaller score but it's it's powerful and a lot of electronics in it mixed with uh, uh, you know real instruments that are affected like with the with delay or or, or whatever they've they've got going on it sounds like a synth arpeggio but it's the horns actually doing these these arpeggios so I love that score yeah, that's awesome. You also have to put John Carpenter in there because he has some clever scores in his films too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I love to score in you know the Halloween movie that not Halloween the uh, the Firestarter movie that everyone's mad at. <laughs> I, I love this. You know, the score is great, of course. But and I guess they didn't do it to film. They they did a they did that score sort of separately. You know, in a room, sort of going by the mood, and then sort of they edit they, they edited it into the film. Um, which is sort of an interesting way to do it. Yeah, my favorite. You want to see the action and go along with the action a little bit. Yeah. You know, my favorite. I guess um, I I suspect Argento did that with Goblin. Oh, Goblin. That was great. I love Argento stuff, man. He's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Especially. I do too. Yeah, especially the score of uh, Suspiria. Yeah. Oh, man, that was so creepy. Hey, that's I've been looking for that one. I've been having a hard time finding that one on vinyl. Eventually, I will find it. That's one of my favorite horror scores, the Suspiria. <laughs> it's beautiful, yeah. And it, and I think I, I don't know the story of it really, but it does. Doesn't it sound like they were sort of jamming, and then yeah, Argento would have edited it in. Like that's another thing about Romero too. He was a brilliant music editor. Like the music that he used for, um, you know, his own version of Dawn of the Dead. There was a lot of sort of library stuff that he uh, that he uh, used, and he did that in Night of the Living Dead too. He used a lot of library music from the High Q Capitol Records uh, vinyl library, so he he would just know exactly where the music would fit and what what would make this scene great. And uh, when I did the Night of the Living Dead live uh, show, um, he he w- he was a little bit he was wondering where they got the music. For it because he thought that he had heard all of the cues on that high cue library so he actually thought that they had found other cues off that same library which was kind of a, a compliment i thought that because that's definitely what i was going for uh just sort of writing something that would fit so well into that into the actual movie and using it in musical theater that's so pr- I sort of fooled i fooled the music the master magician a little bit that way that's the best way to go. Um, so where can everybody find you on social media and um, what you're going to be doing next and, you know, all your projects are out there? Well, I've got my website, uh, that can That's the movie stuff. Uh, the Killjoys have their own website for anything that might be coming up. I'm on Facebook, uh, you know, probably too much. Uh, cause, it's, cause I'm on the computer all day. Right. So it's kind of, it's just right beside me there. So, you know, Facebook, uh, I would say Mike troublecock music.com is the best place though. All right. Uh, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Yes. And everybody, thank you for listening to horror pop. Ed-